You know, Chris, you have, as I mentioned earlier, really uh, written so much about the darker side of nature, human nature, and you've immersed yourself in it. You've really spent a lot of time with people, understood their stories, uh, written about their pathologies. And it's a personal question, but have you, do you have, where do you find hope from when you see all of that? I mean, do you find hope? I, I, I think having spent 20 years outside the United States in societies that are being rent apart by violence, I don't quite share America's mania for hope. Um, when I covered the war in El Salvador, when I covered the war in the former Yugoslavia, it was standard practice for the Salvadoran military, or in the case of the former Yugoslavia Serbian paramilitaries, to go into villages and carry out massacres. And then they would block the roads. So both in El Salvador and in Bosnia, we had to walk in, in, in the case of Yugoslavia with our satellite phones. Uh, the Serbs were, would often have snipers firing on us because they didn't want the massacre reported. And it was the ability to document the atrocity, to give the victims names on the front page of the New York Times often, that was victory enough, that was hope enough. It didn't mean that I wouldn't get up a few days later and do the same thing again. And we did this at tremendous risk in Sarajevo alone, 45 foreign journalists were killed. Dozens were wounded. And I think, as I mentioned with my students, that freedom and that hope is embodied in the act of resistance. Most of the great rebels in history, Malcolm, Martin, Sitting Bull, did not succeed in the eyes of the power elites. But as the theologian James Cone writes, faith is about inverting the world's values. I, I once had dinner with George McGovern, and as a teenager, I had spent the summer working for him uh, in his campaign. And at the dinner, he, I, I told him about what he meant to me. I think I was 15 or something at the time. And he made a comment at the dinner about losing 49 states. And I said, yes, but you never betrayed that 15-year-old boy. And I, I think that those of us who come out of traditions of faith have to have a different concept of time. We're all mortal. Injustice will exist long after we are gone. But it is these invisible witnesses, these magnificent figures who rise up in moments of extremity to do what is right, even at the cost of their own life. And I think for those of us who follow it is about not betraying them. And that, for me, keeps hope alive. And, you know, there's a scene in the, uh, you know, at the end of the Christian Gospels when Jesus is abandoned by everyone. I mean, the crowd turns on him, his disciples flee, everyone abandons him. And, but three weeks later, the disciples are picked up, brought before the court of the Sanhedrin, and... Uh, if they profess faith, they will be condemned to death. And they do. And for me, that is an example of the power of the moral of the spiritual life. That is the true, in the Christian faith, example of resurrection. And as Hamsa knows, I was very close to my father, who was an anti-war activist, a civil Presbyterian minister, and so forth, but who was pushed aside by the institution itself because of his stances. 
And that for me was a very good lesson because I grasped that no institution, even the one you had dedicated your life to, will ever reward you yeah. for doing what is right. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because I remember I had a conversation with you on the phone and, uh, you know, I, uh, you, you said your, that your father taught you a very important thing, which was virtue is its own reward. Yeah. And, and it really hit home for me for the first time, I think, oddly enough, the power of what that actually means, um, which is in the Quran. Hal jazaa'u al-ihsan illa al-ihsan. Is the reward of virtue anything other than virtue? Yeah, well, you, as you know, I came back from the Middle East, where I'd been the Middle East bureau chief for the New York Times. There was this mania after 9-11, for invading Iraq. It was a very lonely time for those of us who were denouncing the calls to invade Iraq. And I was booed off of a commencement stage. And it, I got lynched by the right wing media. And the way they lynch you is hour after hour after hour, day after day. <laughs> right, you've been there. And so I'm finally brought into the New York Times and I'm given a formal written reprimand saying, I'm not allowed to speak about the war in Iraq anymore. And under guild or union rules, you give the employee the written reprimand, and the next time they violate it, they can fire you. Can fire you. And I remember walking, and of course I was going, I left, I wasn't going to not speak. But I remember walking out of the newspaper, and I think articulating for the first time what it was my father had given me. And that was freedom. I didn't need the New York Times to tell me who I was. I knew who I was. I was my father's son. And that is the power of hope. It's the power of resistance. And ultimately, for me, it's the power of faith. So, you know, about what you just said about um, that you don't, um, believe in the, the kind of hope, this American hope, but I think that, and that was a distinction in the verses that were read. Um, false hope is, you know, the, the scholastic called it presumptio. You know, it was the presumption um, that God will grace us because he has to. And, and uh, it's interesting because I think Augustine said that Despair and false hope equally killed the soul. Yeah. They both had the same effect. And one of the things in our tradition, hope, which is raja, uh, is very different from false hope, which is umnia. And, and, and the Prophet Muhammad said that the etymological relationship of the word raja is it's related to, to return, which goes back to the idea of, of the wayfarer, the person on a path. And I think as, as long, you know, one of the things that recently somebody in Hollywood said, you know, the afterlife's a hustle. But for those of us who take it very seriously, that actually believe that there is a day of judgment, you know, Socrates says, you know, you might box my ears off in this life, right? But there's, there's going to be a judge in the next world that, I mean, he goes to the religious argument after he realizes the rational argument won't work with this man. And I think despair will it will happen when people lose sight of the day of judgment. And that's why to believe that there really is ultimate justice, that every person, even in our tradition, the animals will have their day uh, on the day of judgment. So even animals that were wronged will be able to get their right on that day. The earth is raised up and will testify against those that oppressed. The rivers will testify against those that polluted them. That this is, this is all in our tradition. And to believe that, that I and mean, that's what gets me up you know, to pray Fajr. I mean, that, that's literally what gets me up, is that I believe that. I don't think it's a hustle, and I don't think it's a hype. And I think that despair, this idea of natural hope and, and, and supernatural hope uh, that, that Pieper talks about, despair comes in when you, when you have natural hope. Natural hope is, is something young people have because they have a future. But supernatural hope is, is something that grows with age as you get closer to your destination, and we actually see this as one way station on a much longer journey, because there's, there's stations after this life, at, just like there were stations before it. And so 
we're passing through, like you said. And I think if, if you lose sight of the, 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 the pilgrim nature of existence and that the destination has been promised and it's a real destination and it's not this, you know, uh, Joe Hill's pie in the sky, you know, or piety in the sky it is, my friend puts it. You know, it's not, it's real and we believe it. And I think that's, that's the difference. That's why you will find that people that do have a deep faith in this, they don't despair. The Quran says, لا تيأسوا من روح الله. Do not despair of God's grace. Mm-hmm. The only people that despair of God's grace are disbelieving folk, that people mm-hmm. that lose belief. And forgiveness is part of that also. It's a also. deep part of it, yeah. But All my servants who... Which is in that verse because... Transgress yeah. their soul. Don't despair of God's mercy. Verily, God forgives all sins. I, I think uh, resistance and hope is also something we owe to future generations because uh, the Sufis talk about medet, or this sort of spiritual energy that's generated in the past that's transferred into the future. And recently I was reading uh, Rupert Sheldrake, the biologist, the British biologist. He has this idea of morphic resonance. resonance. Mm. And to, to me, and I mean, he researches it, but I'm, I was thinking about things such as hope or resistance that are in, exist in the world because there are human beings such as Dr. King or Malcolm X or Gandhi or whoever, who are Amir Abdul Qadir, Jazeeri, who Chris generated Hedges. Chris Hedges, but he's, he's an heir of it. And what I'm talking about is we've inherited this. Yeah. You inherited it from your father. It's not physical. That's not something physical he gave you. It's metaphysical. And collectively, the resistors and the hopeful will generate that energy that will translate this to future generations. And if we stop, there's nothing. The chain is broken. We say in our religion that Islam is dependent on chains of narration. And were it not for these chains, anyone could have said, anything and attribute it to Islam and we're not for the, this energy that we generate and we pass on and, and we therefore keep it alive in the world, it will perish. And I think for a lot of people it has perished, but it is there. And I think we can strengthen it, we can enhance it, and we can give a, a wealthy, healthy inheritance to those coming after us. So from a theologian's point of view, what is the purpose of hope and how do we understand that in the context of troubled well, times? Yeah, in our tradition, hope is an act of the will. It, and, and despair is an act of the will. These are acts of the will. I mean, obviously, setting aside mental illness and things like that, this is something different. But, but these, these are actually understood to be choices uh, that people make. Um, and there's something, hope, I mean, I think Emily Dickens says very beautiful when she said, you know, hope is the bird with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words. It's something that, it's not rational. It's, it's you know, it sings the tune without the words. It's, it's not rational and never stops at all. And, and then she goes on to say, and, and you know, it's sweetest in the gale is heard. You know, it's, it's sweetest when the times are difficult and, and foul must be the storm that could abash the little bird. You know, what a wretched condition when it, it causes it abash here, like lose faith right. in it. it right. when, so th- conditions that create despair are, are evil conditions. That's why I think the idea that we're dealing with radical evil is a very important concept um, that, that this is something because despair is evil right. and, and to take that away from, from people consciously mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. to, and to know what you're doing uh, is I don't think there's any darker force and, and in our tradition Iblis is the one Ablesa, he despaired mm-hmm. and that's why the demonic force for those of us who believe in supernatural realms There's nothing that delights the demonic force more than despair. Despair of a spouse from from his or her spouse is, is, they exalt in it and it creates a kind of excitement. And there's human beings that share in this, that people who have 
have fallen into real malice because one of the things in, in, you know, with these deadly sins, and I think a lot of what we're dealing with in this book is about we're deadly sins that, that we don't look at anymore. Deadly sins have, they have daughters. Ghazali pointed this out and Aquinas. And one of the, for instance, one of the daughters of greed is a lack of empathy. Right, you have that, to have that. that. that yeah. you, when you become greedy, you, you lose sight of the suffering of other people. You know, from, from our perspective, again, if you lose sight of the journey, right. that we're on a journey, yeah. and, and our hope is in the afterlife. If you put your hope in this world, this world will betray you because it's embedded in the very nature of the world to let you down. It was not designed, and that's the Marxian fallacy that we can create heaven on earth. The, the world was not designed for heaven on earth, uh, for people of faith who believe that it's beyond this. But we should do everything we can to mitigate the symptoms of the world that cause suffering and, and work towards that end. And, and that's why the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in the greatest testimony of hope, he said, if the end of time comes and you are planting a seedling, if you're able to finish planting it, and the, and, and, and the meaning of that story is beautifully embodied in a story of, uh, of Abu Yusuf on his deathbed, one of the great um, jurists in Islam. And he was learning a, uh, a, a, a point of jurisprudence. And one of his students said, you're on your deathbed, why are you doing this? He said, I would rather meet God knowing this knowledge than being ignorant of it. <laughs> and, and that's, I think, where real true hope Mm -hmm. is not hope in this world because y y things can happen, things break down, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Those, all those things happen and when they happen, you have to have the fortitude, the spiritual fortitude to deal with it. And uh, in, in, in Baqarah in 155, the Quran says, we will test you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and loss of life and loss of, of fruits. So give glad tidings to the patient ones. Why are they patient? Mm -hmm. Because they have hope that there's meaning in these tribulations. And once you remove meaning from people's lives, despair is the only answer. The idea that you need to have patience and stillness, um, it seems like a prescription for inaction. That's not what you're saying though, right? Not at all. And, and, but my point is there are a lot of people that are activists mm -hmm. and people that are out there that there's deeper pathologies working in those people. And, and if, they have, if they're not doing spiritual work at the same time, then either they burn out, fall into despair, and very often they have, I mean, there's a, there's a great thing that, uh, that uh, I think it's Emerson talks about, you know, these people da shouting in, in Boston about the slavery in Barbados. And he said, and they treat their wives miserably. You know, that there's a lot of people that have mm. these concerns out there, but they're neglecting their children. They're neglecting their, their, their duties in front of them. And this is where sphere of concern and sphere of influence are very important. Those distinctions are very important. Mm -hmm. what, what, what can we actually change? Because I always want to hear, tell me what to do. But, but when, when you don't give people actually tangible things that they can actually do, um, then, then it becomes, it's just an obsession with something that uh, is very unhealthy for them spiritually. One thing I really appreciate in Chris's writing is the frequent uh, references to the prison. I was reading the, the conversation with uh, Robert Telbach, and uh, you, you talk a lot about the prisons. You mentioned today it's in this book, and just having worked with that population and just being friends, because a lot of that population are from neighborhoods I formerly resided in, uh, and just seeing, I, I would say that they've tapped into something in my immediate context because I, I, I used to go in as a, as a Muslim chaplain and teacher. It was the Muslim community amongst the incarcerated individuals. I, I would say that uh, they, their uh, resistance is more than a moral act, I would say their resistance is something that restores their humanity. Yeah. 
I've seen dehumanized human beings who would kill you with the uh, callousness of stomping on a roach. I've seen individuals that, uh, that lived a degree higher than the misogyny that one might listen to as entertainment in a gangster rap, or even now it's beyond gangster rap, in just some sort of musical uh, recording transformed into human beings who wouldn't unjustly hurt a fly, transformed into human beings that would give their life, and once they were released, to hold a family together. These are people who would tear a family apart with impunity through adultery, through murder, through selling drugs to children, transformed into people that would give their life for their family. So when, when I witness that firsthand up close in human beings that I've seen go from this spectrum of dehumanized to rehumanized, then that gives me tremendous hope because if they can do it, anybody can do it. I'm going to ask all of you to sort of um, tell, give us some advice. Tell us what to do in a way, which is what would you, what thought would you want to leave us all with? People are grappling with tragedies, with the incessant, you know, bad news coming into their feeds and every time they wake up looking at, you know, uh, despair and devastation on the news everywhere. How, what advice do you have for, for everybody here to, um, to not let it push you into despair? Chris, you want to go first? I would say build real relationships which are never built electronically. Um, that it is going to be, I once asked uh, Dan Berrigan before he died how he was responding to the decay of the American empire and he said all we have is the Eucharist and each other, i.e. all we have is ritual and each other and so many people have neither. Whatever that ritual is, we need it and we need to shut off these electronic hallucinations because they are only fueling the atomization and the isolation and the despair. And we have to build relationships the way they're always built, which is face to face. And that means relationships with people who are not like us, may not even believe what we believe. Um, but I think much of the malaise of American society comes from a deep and profound loneliness which is exacerbated by the technology which we all have available in handheld devices. Um, yeah, I think uh, I, one of the things that people uh, are suffering from is distractibility and, and uh, which is again a daughter of acedia of this spiritual slothfulness, of not being on an active path and actually working on yourself spiritually. Mm -hmm. um, we have a limited amount of time. In, in the Chinese Taoist tradition, they, they, they say it's very important to maintain health because you will not overcome yourself before 50 or 60, right? So, so <laughs> they say you owe it to yourself to, to try to maintain health so that you have enough time to, to be prepared for the next step, the journey, because death is coming to us all and the readiness is all. Are we, are we ready for that next step? Because it's coming and, and our, you know, the response to atheists, atheists, the Quran is very clear, let those who want to disbelieve, disbelieve, and let those who want to believe, believe, that there's no argument against it, it's a choice. You're choosing something and this is something that God's given every single human being the ability to make those choices and so I choose to be hopeful and my hope is in God with God and through God it's not in the world with the world or through the world my hope is 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 transcends this world and 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 that's what what I would hope uh, other people recognize that that door is open for anybody um, to, to enter into uh, and it is a choice 
and 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 we 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 should think about it seriously because our civilization is a civilization that just distracts people constantly and never before have the tools of distraction been greater um, I'm Pascal's remark that, that the, all the trouble, troubles in the world are a result of people, the inability for a person to sit alone in his room by himself. And that, that was Kierkegaard. So despair was about fleeing from the self. Um, and, and there's a verse in the Quran, those who forget God will inevitably forget themselves by the very act of forgetting God. Imam Zahid. In, in the ancient world, amongst uh, religious people, solitude was a, a means for spiritual refinement. In the modern world, solitude is a torture technique. <laughs> I, I, I think that, uh, practically speaking, turn off the television, put your phone away for hours at a time, make sure that the first thing you do in the morning is not checking your emails or seeing who texted you and that the last thing you do at night isn't checking to see what Trump is up to. <laughs> Wake up, pray before you go to sleep. If you're a believer, pray. If you're not a believer, meditate. But try to, try to cultivate the ability to be alone with yourself and to find contentment with yourself. And if you believe in God, to find contentment with God. And as Sheikh Hamza mentioned, it's, it's with all the distractions. And don't share. I'm, I, I was thinking, like, that should be quick. Uh, how many people have drawn me into their addictions? Like, people are addicted to YouTube clips. And I know thousands of people. And they're all sending me the must-view clip. <laughs> and I didn't choose any of them based on the logic and direction of my life. They've introduced them into my life. And so I'm going to send a message out, don't share your addiction with me. Because I have enough trouble overcoming my own. <laughs>